Paddy Tuffy, who was lecturing in the new in the geography department. And I'm really excited about this lecture. I can remember when I took people down to the Black Valley in Kerry, I was stunned to hear that one, it was the very last place in Ireland to get electricity. And can any of you even think of the dates it got electricity? It was 90 in the 1970s. It seems so recent, and it blew me away that that was the last place in Ireland in the Black Valley to get electricity. So, Paddy, I'm delighted that you're here tonight to inform us how Mayo, is it mainly Mayo your work? Uh, no, yeah, good question. Yeah, I think it is, yeah. yeah. Or did I let the cat out of the bag? No, 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 I'm going to look at Mayo as well. Mayo so, and beyond. Anyway, <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you. Turn it down. Oh. Just a flashing one. Sorry. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I, I talk about the oil lamp in a moment, but um, I suppose uh, the reason I'm doing this is I was just explaining there to Ollie that um, back in the 1990s, mid to late 90s, um, it was 50 years after the beginning of the rural electrification, and I discovered the ESB archives in Harris Cross. You had this building at Harris Cross with all lots of stuff in it. Uh, a big room about this size with filing cabinets and maps and photographs and things. Total chaos. Just, you just walked in and there were big tables with stuff piled up on the tables and filing cabinets with photographs and stuff. Totally disorganized. But I spent a few, a few weeks going in there and looking through stuff and gradually, you know, uh, taking out, uh, getting a coherent picture of, of what went on during the rural electrification period. And then I got stu my students, I used to send in some tutorial groups into the archives to check out their parish. And I had part, part of the project, part of the exercise for them was to go back to the parish and talk to older people, uh, elderly people in the parish who remembered the, the 50, 40s and 50s and kind of, you know, come up with the story of, of the beginning of the rural electrification program. <coughs> and now um, I've got to that stage where I'm one of those older people uh, who's, who's just about barely remembering the rural electrification, which is 75 years ago at this stage, more or less. The first pole was erected in North County Dublin in 1946. So it's been almost 75 years uh, since, the first, since it began. So I thought it would be interesting to talk about it, to look at it again, and to think about the beginning. And in fact, in the men's shed, uh, they, this, there were a whole lot of old fellows in the men's shed. Some of them are here tonight. <laughs> and quite a number of them actually remembered the, uh, the beginnings of the rural, the rural electrification in Mayo. <clears throat> and uh, so I thought it would be interesting because it's getting back now 75 years. Uh, and our memories are fading of that time. And of course, the younger people, anybody under, uh, Anybody born in, from the 1960s onwards uh, would have no memory of that period of pre-electric Ireland, pre-electric rural Ireland especially. They won't have any memory of that. And they're living in a world with electricity everywhere and all the buildings and all the houses and all the households in, in the country, in the countryside, are linked up by electricity and powered by electrical energy. So that's a different world. Uh, so I talk about that and I talk about, I try and a lot of people probably have memories that we might, we might come back to later on. <clears throat> but it was a world where you had no, uh, you know, where the houses were disconnected in the sense, houses in the countryside didn't have any connection. They were isolated units in the middle of the countryside, unconnected by cables and wires, as I call it, wiring. And the house that I grew up in in Monaghan, I'll make a couple of references to Monaghan very briefly. <coughs> the house I grew up in, this was our, this was the lamp that we had here. Uh, in the living room, uh, which my father lit every evening in wintertime. I have just fragmentary memories of it. His job was to light the, light the oil lamp, but this was, it, this is actually a sham here, because it's a fraud, a fraud, actually, I'm, I'm afraid of you when you hear, I mean, that's a candle inside. Originally, it was a mantle, uh, and you had to pump it, and you had to put in methylated spirits to start it off, and then light it, and gradually turn it up. And it had, a, I remember, my memory is it was a lovely, it had a lovely uh, yellow, mellow, or not so much yellow, but a mellow glow 
uh, and it was great. And uh, when I was about four years of age, apparently, I, my, my dad had a fiddle and uh, I was swinging the bow of the fiddle at some stage and I smashed the globe. Well, in, in, the dar in his diary, he has mentioned this, that I broke the globe and that was a serious mistake on my part. <laughs> so, um, and I was asking, and again, I'd be interested in people's memories. I mean, I, I, I just can't remember how we, how we managed with, uh, you know, going to bed at night in winter and so on. I mean, today we have lights everywhere. We just switch on things. But in, the, in those pre-electric days, I mean, so my sister remembered having a lamp that we had an, another lamp, a little oil paraffin lamp at the top of the stairs. Uh, that, was, that was something I don't remember at all. So it was, you know, after five o'clock in the winter's evening, and everything was darkness. So it was, and outside was obviously completely dark. Um, the other thing uh, I was mentioning to Iris, we had, um, I remember a Christmas tree. We had a Christmas tree, pre-electric Christmas tree. And my dad had, uh, uh, little candles on clips, and he clipped the candles on the br different branches of the tree and lit them. And then still, he sat there for maybe 30 minutes or so with us watching this tree, and then he blew the candles out because it was obviously a fire hazard, you know, on a, on a thing. So that, that was a, another memory I have. And I'm sure you, you all have memories as well. Uh, and all the, other, all the other things, you know, apart from light and, you know, night and darkness and, uh, and so on. Uh, apart from electricity banishing the darkness in that sense, uh, um, you had other uh, things, pre-electric lifestyle and pre-electric stand living standard that was pretty uncomfortable and pretty difficult. Uh, there was no piped water, you know, in the countryside. There was, what else? Um, and farming, my uncle had a farm in North County Monaghan, and I remember he had horses and uh, he had, uh, you know, I, one of the things I remember when I was at school going down to his farm and when he was spraying the potatoes, which he did, which people did, they grew lots of potatoes in the, in the, back in the early 50s. Uh, when he was spraying the potatoes, he had to go down to the uh, river and literally bucket by bucket lift up the water from the river and put it into this big uh, spray thing and, and it had all, you know, so it was tremendous, tremendously labor intensive. Farming was very uh, kind of a muscle muscle bound labor intensive uh, business at the time. And that, that was a big breakthrough when electricity came. So that's pre-electric farming, pre-electric living standards uh, were, were much more uh, uncomfortable than all those of you who, had, who grew up in towns and cities, especially towns in Mayo. I mean, the, the Mayo town, and I'll come back to that in a moment. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna talk about, about um, uh, Pre-electric, just very briefly, what it was like before electricity. And one of the things I've just noticed here, uh, wiring uh, the countryside. There was a pre-electric wiring of the countryside, and that was the telegraph, the telephone. And I, I just incidentally pick, pick on some examples of this as we go through looking at some of the images. Uh, the telephone, and the tape, that came from the late 19th century, early 20th century, you had the gradual expansion of the telephone or telegraph lines along the railways and along the main roads. So that went back to the to the uh, 19, really early 1900s. Um, so, and, and that linked the, wire, the telephone and telegraph wires linked uh, going along the uh, running al along the railroad railways and along the main roads. <coughs> it, it, set up a network, a wired network, uh, linking up things like post offices, postal exchanges, uh, police stations, initially RIC stations, uh, um, maybe uh, shops in the countryside, in the villages and so on, the priest house probably, the doctor's house maybe, and so on. Very limited number of telephones and so on at that stage. So a limited amount of wiring of the countryside took place before the electric, rural electrification scheme. So, um, so urban areas were the first areas to be electrified uh, from an, an early period. Uh, <clears throat> Dublin electric light, I mean, the big city starting off in Dublin, Dublin had its electric light company back in the 1890s. And the electricity was, was, was uh, the electricity was generated by you know, generators, oil fire generators, or in some cases, uh, wind power, but mostly oil 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 fire generators. Uh, the Dublin Electric Light Company, the 
Rathmines and uh, Pembroke, for example, townships in Dublin had their own separate electrical system for the street lights and so on. Most of these, and so on, into the countryside then, out into the country, into the county towns, the big towns and so on, they had, most of them, very early on in the 20th century, had uh, had electricity provided by companies, uh, commercial companies, which would set up in a town and they would have maybe 20, 30, 40, 100 subscribers who paid for it and they were connected up. So they had a limited private enterprise kind of electricity network provided in, the, in that. That was pre-rural electrification. By 1922, there were 140 mostly privately owned separate operations in place powered by coal, gas, and oil uh, generation, uh, or in some cases run by uh, private companies, as I said, or by the local authorities. Now, the first, so what I'll do is I'll just look at the first stage in the electrical connection. That's the first stage, which is the town connection. And you just move over here to the first. In, and you probably recognize this is our Prussia. This is the Shannon scheme. The Shannon scheme had been had been uh, moved into a back at the end of the 19th century. And in fact, there was legislation passed by the Westminster government uh, in the early 20th century to to build a hydro station, uh, hydroelectric station on the Shannon. But then this First World War intervened, and then the War of Independence in Ireland and the Troubles and all that, and that was the end of that scheme. So we we, we come to the Free State. This notion, this idea, was picked up by the Free State in 1925. So they started the Shannon scheme hydroelectric station at building it at Arthur Prussia. And that became a symbol of the independence of the free state. And it's interesting that they, when they set it up, they, uh, they contracted it out to Siemens, the German uh, company, almost, I think, I suspect almost deliberately avoiding any British connection, any British uh, provider. They went to put Siemens in to build it, and they spent 1925 to 29, in four years or so, they had built this, and it became, part of Prussia became a big, iconic development for the new Free State. That first decade, I mean, the Free State was busy doing all sorts of things to try and uh, try and uh, demonstrate its independence, newly found independence. There were, the, there were conferences in Paris trying to get, uh, uh, get onto uh, European conferences, uh, post-war conferences, and so on and so forth. <coughs> and this was, the League of Nations, <coughs> and Arden Crusher was a, was a, a physical uh, manifestation of the state, the free state's uh, attempt to, uh, to uh, demonstrate its independence from uh, the United Kingdom. In 1927, then, the Electricity Supply Board, the ESB, was set up as a, as a, a semi-state uh, development, semi-state based on ideas in Scandinavia and so on, but mainly, but, but a lot of them were ideas that popped up in Ireland. Semi-state, so it was, it was set up to run, distribute, to run the electric, electrical system to generate the electricity, to distribute it through wires, cables, and so on, and, but more, most importantly of all, to sell it, to sell the electricity to consumers nationwide, as opposed to uh, private enterprise uh, selling providing and selling the, the electricity. Uh, and at the time, indeed, the, uh, the common and Gaelic government, which was thinking, but there was a lot of friction and so on within the government and so on to try and, a lot of people were in favor, a bit, a bit like today, of, in favor of letting private enterprise do the whole thing and the state not to get involved at all. But the ESB, the government stuck to its guns and set up the ESB semi-state body to, provide, to run, distribute, and uh, sell the electricity. And cell is important because, as you see later on, uh, when they got to the rural electrification stage, a big part of the program was selling it. They had demonstrators going around, a mobile demonstration unit uh, in different parts of the country, and they had people employed to actually sell washing machines and, and, and fridges and various things, and irons and kettles and all sorts of stuff uh, to the consumer. So that was part of the semi-state operations uh, uh, program. Uh, so uh, when, they, when the ESB was set up, then it took over as a semi-state legislative, legislatively uh, uh, established organization. It, it compulsorily took over all the private suppliers of electricity in all the towns. So they could just moved in and took over. It was a company, uh, say, with 100 subscribers in, in a certain town. They just took the whole, the whole thing, shooting, uh, uh, 
what is it, uh, lock, stock, and barrel. And, uh, and, and the only difference they had, obviously, the big name, the technical side of it is the difference between D DC and AC. Uh, D uh, DC, direct current, a lot of these small providers in, in, in local towns had direct current uh, systems in place. But the uh, alter, um, alternating current or AC current, uh, I, I understand, is better for long distance distribution of, of energy, of electrical energy. So, so they took over the local providers and they converted it to AC and, and that started that So, uh, the, the, the next slide shows uh, the map, the map on the left there shows the, uh, oh, could give me a little pointer, so thank you. Uh, the map on the left shows the, uh, this map here was, was one of the early, showing the, the layout from Arden Russia down here, and the, the high tension cables going, the big one here going up right up to Dublin, and then branching off, different branches going from town to town. So that was the skeletal framework, high tension framework uh, of uh, provide uh, power from our Pressure uh, connecting up the towns. So that was the urban uh, pr provision from the beginning. And then gradually, that was 1929, 30, 31, and then in the next 10 years, a number of other power stations were developed. There was one up in er the Erin Station up in Ballyshannon, and then there were others, uh, Polifuka in Wicklow, and they were all hydro stations that were set up. And then within a few years, they started building peak generated, peak generating, peak gener generating power stations as well in the, the bogs and mountains. No. So uh, that system then, uh, oh, this is great, I can read my notes here. Uh, uh, so that, that was the system that, that connected up the towns. And 1931 was when Westport was connected. The, the electricity network in West, the electricity thing in Westbrook was, was, was 1931. Oh yeah, the other thing I want to point out here is, here we have the, the new power lines, the super duper uh, high tension cables being built across the country. Uh, this is one near Maryborough, uh, and so it's carrying six conductors up here, and it heads along across the country, along the roads. And similarly here, here we are going on. But note, note this one here, these are the, the pre-electric, uh, telephone, telegraph lines running along the, the railroads. You probably remember those, they're all gone now. But I remember going on a train. If you're going on a train, you know, from Dublin to Belfast or whatever, these, these, uh, these poles here with all maybe 20, 30, 40 telephone lines or along them would flash past in the train. But they're all gone. That's a, that's a, that was a symbol of the, the pre-electric uh, uh, network. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. So, Westport 2030 was connected, and this is this is from the ESBs connected Westport and 216 customers to the national grid in 1930 via the Shannon scheme. Okay. The, and the, the ESB, the, the archive says, we have no record of any commercial electricity supplier here before the ESB. And, I, and the population of Westport is 3,488. I mean, I doubt very much that there, was, there must have been some electrical supplier that clearly have lost, I don't know, they've lost memory. I'd say, for example, Westport House had its own electrical supply. Uh, you know, it could have had lights and so on. I think they had gas. Yeah. Westport House, but what about the town? I mean, the town must have had some plan. There must have been somebody supplying electricity. But anyway, the, the archive says the word. So this map, these, all these little circles here, you see these circles? Forget about the, the stars. The stars, that represents, the stars represent the rural program after the 1940s. But the circular things represent the towns that were connected up in that first phase from Arden Prussia. And the te high tension cables going up and zigzagging across it and setting up this skeletal framework uh, connecting the towns. Okay. And then in the 1930s, through the 1930s, uh, when, the, when the towns were be, being incorporated in the network, uh, the, the government 
had, there was a big commitment in the government to actually introduce rural electrification, and a lot of the politicians were clamouring for their their constituents to get as, to be treated like the urban constituent. But in fact, there's a big difference in terms of connecting them up and wiring the countryside. I mean, sorry, uh, no, okay. the. Uh, uh, the, big difference, the big difference is, of course, that if you're living in Westport or Galway or, or Limerick or whatever, all the houses, you're all squashed together in a blob of people beside each other. It's easy to connect up the houses, comparatively easy, and it's certainly cheaper than out in the countryside when you go out here from here to, you know, to uh, Belmullet. Houses are scattered across the countryside, distances apart. And, and so it becomes much more expensive, as we see. But there was a commitment by the government to actually look into rural electrification in the 1930s. It gradually, it just kept recurring, we have to do something about it. Uh, and um, um, because, like for example, agriculture was so, so important, I mean, hugely important. Now, two thirds of the, of the population were involved in, in farming. And, and clearly electricity would have been a big advantage for farming at the time. Households were generally dispersed across, across the country. The big problem and the challenge for rural areas, for the, which, which became connected subsequently, the big problem was low population density, scattered housing, uh, not only that, but uh, demographically unbalanced, uh, aging populations in the West especially. So the West was the problem, Mayo was the problem. You know, all the areas that had been depopulated by immigration and so on had, had a, a, an aging population, a much greater proportion of older people who instinctively and uh, by, by nature were skeptical about the value of electricity and about, you know, spending money on, 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 this, on, this, uh, on this scheme when they were getting, getting on quite well with uh, oil, paraffin oil and, uh, and so on, uh, especially bachelors. Single men living in, out in the countryside didn't see the point in spending money on electricity. <laughs> men. So, um, by, 19, by 1939, it was acknowledged that only a, sub, a, a, a subsidized scheme would make electrification of the countryside of rural areas possible. A subsidized scheme, because clearly it was uneconomic. There was no, uh, there was, uh, Commercially, the rural areas, you know, West Mayo, uh, North Mo West Monaghan, Cavan, all those rural areas were commercially unattractive and challenging for, for, for supply. In fact, in, in Britain, which had maybe 70, 80 percent of the population was urban, living in big cities and so on, they sort of more or less dismissed the possibility of uh, rural electrification for their countrysides uh, before, uh, until the 1960s, in many cases. They just said it was too expensive and it was prohibitive and they weren't going to do it. Ireland, they decided to do it in Ireland, but and the only way they could do it was to subsidise the provision of electricity to the countryside. So they agreed to subsidise it on the basis of an annual revenue accruing from a 70% uptake. So if 70% of the population in the different communities agreed, signed up for electricity and became, uh, became consumers, that that would make it make it economically viable, and if if Paddy Garrity is here, I haven't got any. Paddy has a whole lot of queries about this, about this, uh, uh, the cost and so on, and the subsidising. It's it's really complicated. I was trying to look up notes that I had uh, today, and I just couldn't make sense. But I mean, there was two and fro between the governments, the the 1930s Fianna Fáil government, and then the the first coalition come in, and they wanted to change it again back and forth and all sorts of ideological uh, arguments about subsidies and so on. But generally speaking, if they could get 70% of it, you'd see, when I show you some of the notes, uh, some of the uh, records from Mayo uh, and indeed from Monaghan, uh, it, it, it show, it, you can see the emphasis on trying to get as many consumers to sign up, because the more they got to sign up, the more it became viable, uh, the project. So. The scheme was rolled out in 1944, just at the end of the war, really, uh, all over the country. And at the same time, and in fact, this map is for, from later on, this is from 19, uh, 1952, areas that are, were electrified in 1952, all these dark areas here. And uh, these are parishes, 
I'll mention that in a moment. But but you can see it's scattered because the, the project it's quite a quite a clever project. I mean, when they said when they decided they we're going to go for it, it, they just didn't start off in Dublin and say right we're going to head off Dublin, plod plod across the country and end up in, in Mayo or Donegal or whatever. They, they, the first parish was somewhere in North Dublin, Lusk or somewhere, and then there was one in Mayo. And, you know, so they were popping up and they had selected different areas so that the the project, as it was rolled out, could be a could be a, an exemplar or it could be seen highly visible to all the local people and it could spread across the country. So uh, that was it. Was going to be a, every every uh, parish was going to become a, a kind of a, an example and a, a, a testing ground to persuade people to sign up for the project. So in 1952, all these areas were, had, by 1952, they were all electrified, connected up to the system, rural areas. And it's just interesting when you look at the, these grey areas here, are down as areas of low valuation. You know, we, we know what they are, you know, it's mountain, bog land, poor land, uh, low incomes, uh, generally speaking, challenging for this kind of scheme. For example, me, Kildare, if you look up the records and read it, they're there. The people there were just throwing money at it. They wanted to get the lights here and lights there and here. Oh, when, you got to, when you got to Mayo and when you got to Kerry and Clare and so on, uh, people are much more cagey. And Cavan and Monaghan, people are very careful about you know, signing up. Because it just, in many cases, because it was much higher than poverty and so on. And, uh, people were, people were, and we see, you see examples of that. Um, no, then I want to just so I want to move then quickly to uh, yeah that, those uh, those uh, little things there that you can't probably see very well. They during the war then you know I mentioned the towns were connected up, but then during the war uh, the towns were connected up and they had heating systems, electric you know, cookers, uh, ovens. Uh, fridges, etc, etc, etc. And then the war came and they had to have rationing. So these little ads here, they're in the archives. Just interesting to see people were only allowed to use the electricity for three hours a day or something, you know. So it was because of oil supplies were, were, were in short supply and, and, and so on and so forth. So 1940s slowed down. And then after that, then we moved to the actual rural electrification, the first poles being set up, 1947. I think I mentioned to, to Bill, this is like the famous EO, what's it called, EO Jima, EO Jima, EO Jima, you know, the <laughs> US troops in uh, hoisting the flag, you know, so here they have, and this is the, the guy in the boss in charge here, telling me what to do with these, all these guys. The first pole, and that was it. It's kind of a bit lyrical here, what the, what the, the, the ESB says in, in they, they set up, a, at the very beginning, they set up a rural electrification office in Dublin and they started, pr you know, uh, sending out propaganda and making a record, really, of what was going on in the poll project. And this is a bit poetic here, as the poll was raised right. in the gathering dusk of that November, those present realised that a start was being made on a scheme which was to bring a new life to the hills and valleys of rural Ireland and a new outlook and new hope to those who dwell there. It's true. 1946, one construction crew in County Dublin and one in Limerick had built 63 kilometres of line. Not to start. So there we are, Limerick and Dublin examples, and it's just spread from there, uh, on. So uh, bring new life, uh, basically bring a convergence of rural and urban. So the rural uh, people were going to start catching up with the, 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 the well, the, you know, the, the, the well-off, uh, comfortable urban dwellers with their electrical suppliers and so on again. So here we have the poles and then you have the connections coming in here uh, and, um, and the famous, these famous trucks and vans and so on. And this, this particular house here, this detached house, uh, pole being set up, I don't know where, usually the, the line was connected to a chimney. You know, you had a pole and then you had a chimney. I can't see a chimney in this house here, so I don't know what they, what they, what they managed it. Um, so, how it happened, the way it was done, uh, the, it was a very, it was a military operation, uh, well organized. Uh, the first thing was they picked, ca ca as I said, Catholic parishes, because the reason they picked Catholic parishes, Roman Catholic parishes, was because uh, the parish was a community territory. It was, a, it had a significant number of people living in the same area who were connected 
kind of, uh, I'll call it kin, I suppose, in many cases, but socially connected, you know. Uh, uh, and, in, you know, the, the Catholic parish in the 1940s, everybody went to Mass once a week at least, and so they met each other once a week, and the whole place was, it was a solid community uh, spirit, community feeling in the place. So the Catholic parish was a good idea, and in fact, all the maps that the orders that the uh, ESB used, uh, the, the initial maps, parish maps, they drew, made up these manuscript parish maps, and they deposited them in, in the library in Maynooth. I remember when I started Maynooth many years ago, <clears throat> all these maps, big flat sheets were lying in a corner in the, in the old library, and uh, we could see where clerical students for the previous 20 years who were getting, they just come in. There was no proper, you know, guardianship in the library at the time, and they just come in and pull down their area and put a little viral mark on where their house was on the map, you know. So uh, we had to get those maps locked away. But the county parish was chosen, and then in each parish there was a, com uh, a committee. And the, the other reason they were chosen was because there was a groups called like Munchen or Chira, the ICA, uh, Macrona Firma, the GIA, football clubs, and community councils. They were all in existence. There was a kind of a social infrastructure in the parish that was, that was there that was very important uh, to establish their scheme. Uh, they, the local committees were set up because people were quite, a lot of people were anxious to set up a committee and they went out trying to persuade people to sign up. So they got a preliminary sign up. And then uh, very soon afterwards, the ESB, uh, the Rural Electrification Office, sent out teams to canvas the local areas and get confirmation that people were, were going to take it. And many people signed up initially and then they changed their minds when they looked at the, started thinking about the cost. Especially the further west you went, the more backsliders you had. That's what they were called by the ESB, backsliders, who had said they were going to take it and then they changed their minds, you know. So the, 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 uh, the, the group, the organization, the ESB had a, they had some, you know, guys who were trained psychologically to back out and try and persuade these backsliders to change their minds again, and so on. So that, that occurs in, in the record, all the problems they had with that. So, uh, then they had the, then they had the, the polls and the, 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 well they had set up, they sent out survey teams and engineers and surveyors as one went out to plot, to design, you know, the network, to design the, the lay, layout of the lines and stuff like that, very technical stuff. Uh, and then they had to get uh, the polls, the, the polls. Initially, they were going to go for concrete polls. Like in, um, I've noticed any of you ever in France, in France all the polls, uh, the electricity poles are made from concrete, and maybe elsewhere in Europe and the continent as well. I'm not sure because, uh, but uh, they, they worked. They had an initial experiment with the concrete poles, but they decided they were too difficult and expensive, too difficult to handle. So they went for uh, timber poles. Uh, Ireland didn't have enough timber. Didn't have enough. They had enough to provide telegraph poles. Okay, they were small in numbers. But the, uh, for, any, for this big project, they needed about more than a million poles, they estimated. So in the end, they went to Finland, and they got the poles in Finland. And, and for 30 years, I think it was, I, I was reading, 30 years, there were ships going back and forth between uh, uh, the Finnish ports, can't remember the name of the port, North Finland, going back, going to Dublin, to Limerick, to Cork, loaded down with poles for, for uh, for, for the, the scheme. The poles were, so these depots in Limerick, Cork, and Dublin were, had creosoting places for soaking the poles of the creosote. Uh, and then they, were, then they were distributed by tractor into the countryside. Uh, many of the, the roads in the West of Ireland, especially in, in, in Mayo and so on, and, and Donegal, uh, the roads were inferior, were, were unable, the tractors were too heavy, so they had to bring them in by, by coaster along the shore, along the, the western coast. Into, for example, they came into Westport here to load off several hundred poles for distribution in the local area, in the West, in West Mayo area. And so on, up and down in Donegal, several little ports that, were used to offload the, the, the electric poles. <clears throat> uh, and I remember, I remember when they were coming to, to our area in Monaghan, I remember the guys, 
so there's the lo so there's working with the poets. We're often local uh, local labour was employed in the different parishes as he moves across the country. And I remember them covered in creosote. And I know if, I, I know since that I read that creosote is, was a highly toxic, highly dangerous substance. But at the time there was no. In fact, uh, some of the photographs show all the guys working on these poles and digging holes and so on. None of them had any kind of health and safety. Didn't count in those days. Uh, they didn't have helmets. They did. The fellows were there with jackets and ties, and they were, uh, you know, working away. <laughs> Uh, but um, they, I mean, these guys here are the ordinary day clothes. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I was when I was a student. Uh, I remember going on a field trip to Denmark, and I mean, the big contrast I saw found in the mid '60s was uh, when I came back to Denmark. All the farmers in Denmark, you see them out in the country, and they all had big oil skins and overalls and so on and so forth. And then I came back to Monaghan, and the farmers there had jackets and cars and ties and, and you know soft caps and so on. So there's, there was a big change, difference between our, rural Ireland and rural Europe at the time. Now uh, the poems then came in uh, and the first poems were elected in County, erected in County Dublin in 1946 as we see. seen. And 48 there were 17 crews who erected 17,286 poems. Uh, in 1953 75 areas were being incorporated every year. So it was really, it was an exponential, you know, it was just going faster and faster and faster as he moved along. Uh, most of the, the areas were electrified within, by 10 to 12 years after it started in 1946. It was, it was an amazing, uh, I think it was one of the biggest capital investment and successful government programs. I mean, I know there's been, you know, the motorways that were built since the 90s and so on, big projects, but this was the first big one and it was very successful. I mean, look at the National Children's Hospital, big project that's <coughs> of fortune and seems to be in all sorts of trouble. Um, so, and then, as, as the poles were erected then, the wiring was carried out, so there were teams going along, uh, measuring houses and, 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 and then contractors, households then had to get their own contractors to wire the houses. Uh, and I think somebody was telling me in the men's shed this morning, there were, quite a number of cowboys uh, doing uh, wiring at the time, uh, but uh, I don't know if they were talking, they were probably talking about other parts of the country, not the name. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, so I just have a secret of maps here from the ESB archives uh, showing, uh, th th these are just more examples of coal being erected, but here we have 1947, these are all the towns that have been already electrified 10 years earlier, 15 years earlier. They're all finished. But these little stars here are appearing. So 1947, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. There's, there's one down in Galway here. They haven't got to, oh, there's one up near Westport. Uh, don't know about that. Yeah. That might be Morris, I'm not sure. Uh, but anyway, you can see the beginnings of the electrical, uh, of the rural electrification. And then we move on, 1948, 1949, 1950, look at the way the spread expanded <coughs> as we go along here. Yeah. So when you get to 50, it's pretty, it's pretty, expanded pretty rapidly. And then, 19... 1953, mm. 1956, look at all the stars everywhere, 1961, and 61 is, you're getting to the, the latest, being, everywhere is being, being connected, everywhere, and it's becoming, you know, one of the things I mentioned, the switch on, when, when, you know, at the beginning, the big moment was the switch on, at all the places, but when the parish was completely linked up, and the rest was switch on, so, so it was a big celebration, a big get together with lots of food and, and, and music and everything. And they got in the local parish hall and then they switched on, usually presided over, as we'll see in a moment, by the parish priest, uh, switch on. And 1946, 47, 48, that was a big thing. And all the local newspapers and so on reported it, big news. By the time you get to 1960, 
boring. Nobody bothered with it. No <laughs> big celebration switch on. And even 1954, when 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 my house switched up, where I grew up in Monaghan, uh, when it was connected, there was my dad had a diary and, and just I was looking forward to reading about you know the electricity coming in 1954, and I went along and counted it a day, and he just said uh, the electricity was switched on tonight. It's very good. Or something, you know, and that was a real disappointment, you know. So at that stage, uh, that was ten years after it had started. Uh, it was just kind of because people were familiar with it from neighbouring areas. They were familiar with it, you know, in other areas that had been connected. So there was nothing, innovative, nothing novel about it anymore. So, okay. Uh, and actually, this is just an image I thought was very interesting. This is the St. Patrick's Day Parade, 1954. Uh, and you can see one of the floats is a ginormous tractor carrying, you know, hauling uh, electricity poles down O'Connell Street. Uh, you know, so it was, that was an odd thing. These are the dates. And the record shows all, you know, when it started, 47. The number of poles erected, 1,300 miles of line strung, 39 miles. Consumers connected none at that stage, and then you just work your way down, and it's just, it's just the graph is just zooming up, more and more poles, more and more miles or kilometres, more and more customers, uh, a very successful uh, military operation really. Um, in, in Mayo, there was a, there's some of the places there, and I was a bit missing there at the end, but you can see the dates. Uh, Ballandine, 1943. Uh, Challenge Street, that's 1943. So that's, that's Ballandine, that's a small village, is it? Yeah. Town in an urban area. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and then you have some here, the Holly Mount, 1949, 53, 50, 52. The 50s was a critical period when everything was happening very fast. Yeah. Well, right. Uh, well, Rani started in 1951, finished June 1951, finished August 52, and then the number of poles used, uh, the line used, 98 kilometers, uh, premises connected 360. It's a great record, really, you know, uh, showing the whole thing. And, and you won't be able to read a lot of this, but, but the, somebody asked me, "Is there, this is Mayo, for all the areas, the REO News, REO News, the Rural Electrification Office, produced a newsletter every uh, couple of weeks, uh, a typescript essentially at this stage, and uh, it's just a record of you know, reports coming in from the different parishes describing what, what was going on. Uh, a lot of it is, it's kind of, uh, you know, the, here, I just the number of final acceptances in Mulrani was 392, 63%, as against the original uh, authorization of 321. Well, that's a big increase. So there was there was an increase of 71, and addition, additional revenue. That was a whole important thing all the time, talking about how much more, how much revenue was being generated. But there were 47 backsliders uh, <laughs> with a revenue loss of 207 pounds and so on and so forth. So they, they were being targeted to try and keep, get them to change their minds. Uh, let me see, what else? Uh, uneconomic premises totaled this. Uneconomic premises would be farms and households that were distant, at a distance up on the mountain or something where it was going to cost a lot to put in so many extra poles to get them connected and so on. So they were, they were kind of left to the end if they were may, maybe ignored completely. Now, uh, I wanted to try and highlight this stuff here, but I just couldn't find a way to do it, you know, so uh, technology got me, got the best, better with me. Um, come on. Now, uh, where is this? Uh, Akel. This is Akel, is it? On the left top. Oh yeah, Akel, and I'm sorry, it's missing a bit. But the thing I wanted to mention about Akel was, uh, it's impossible to learn to fully to realise fully the difficulties of this bleak terrain unless uh, unless unless conditions have actually been experienced. The winds from October, yeah. So they mentioned winds from October to March are unusual, even by Western standards. 
and uh, lateral staying had to be carried out on a very large scale. So they had to get these, uh, you know, stay things to hold the poles up. And in fact, at the beginning, a lot of those, they, they discovered a lot of the material, like the hawsers and so they discovered the, the wires that they needed to hold the poles. They got a, a lot of, po you know, wo wartime, post-war, what do you call it, uh, leftover stuff from the, the main Second World War. Uh, in Britain, they got lots of they got submarine carry hawsers and all sorts of the military stuff, and they bought a lot of this in, in, in cheap lots and uh, used that to hurt, to to um, tie up the boat. But, but Ackle was a problem. And quite a, frequently, stays and sleepers had to be used in boggy foundations, and they talk about boggy foundations in, in Mayo, uh, in Monaghan, they talked about rocky foundations and uh, the, the problems because the bombs didn't have enough. They had to use tar barrels, whatever they did with those animals. <laughs> they put concrete in the tar barrels and put rust in the They talk about tar barrels having to be used to stabilize the poles. And, so and of course, all this cost money. And incidentally, this was all done by hand in most cases, 1940s, 50s. The guys who put, put the, the poles in Monaghan where I was, when I was growing up, I remember them digging. You had to dig the poles, dig the holes by hand with crowbars and pickaxes and occasional jelly knife if there was, if there was a lot of rock. Uh, so you'd, you'd put in the jelly knife and everybody would hide behind the ditch and then blow it up and then clear it up. So the whole, this guy, this um, this particular engineer, he, he's a very systematic report here. He talks about, uh, Mr. Brennan tells us that three types of holes were encountered, rock holes, water holes, and rock and water holes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and, you know, and then they all the rain, and then they had to wait for the holes to dry up and stuff, so it was quite a problem. Um, okay. And now, um, okay, so the next stage after that was, was uh, selling the stuff. Selling the power, selling the appliances that go with the, with the electricity, and you know the, the first one, the one that was most popular of all, especially in rural areas and, and in rural farming areas, was outside lighting. So it meant that the farmyard could be, instead of having to use a storm lamp or a tilly lamp or whatever, you know, walking around, uh, they could have lights lighting up the yard, and that was a big breakthrough, and it allowed the farmer to extend the day, the working day, and allowed to carry out milking. Uh, milking operations and so on, and whatever, uh, in the farm. So that is, that's an example of a photograph of, of one, I think it looks like a hall or something. And then, of course, the biggest uh, winner in the rural areas was the pump, the electric pump. And, this, and of course, all the guy, all the people demonstrate, photographs are quite interesting, you know, they, they show that it's a man's world, essentially. All these guys were explaining how to use pumps, how to use uh, washing machines and all, all sorts of stuff. Uh, this, in this case, he's explained the pump, and the pump was an amazing change. It really changed the life, lifestyle, life standard, living standards completely in rural areas because it got piped water in. It got farming that was able to pipe in water into the into the farm buildings, etc. The mobile uh, demonstration unit. There were a number of these going around the country, showing people uh, on the farm and in the home the different things they could use so, to try and persuade them to buy stuff. That was the thing. Uh, and, and they were competing, of course, with local suppliers as well, because a lot of, in the towns, the towns already had a, an infrastructure of shops selling electrical goods, because they had, they had had the electricity uh, 10, 15, 20 years before. So the electricity, ESB, had to step gingerly without stop, treading on the toes of local electrical suppliers in the towns. Because, and a lot of the consumers in the hinterland of the towns would, you know, they'd prefer to go to the local provider in the town, to the private shop and so on, and buy the stuff that they had always traded with in, in, in the previous years. So switching on then was the big uh, winner, was a big moment. And this is a typical photograph, uh, of, you know, of the, the, the priest making a speech, blessing the, the whole project. Uh, and people all around it, these guys here are, are obviously electricity, yes, REO, 
probably the rural electrification office people coming in. And this guy here is, you know, he, you know who he is, what he's up to. Money. He's a reporter from the local newspaper, and he appears in quite a number of photographs. The same person they are taking notes, and then it would appear in the Mayo News or the Western People or whatever. For, you know, and it, that was tremendous publicity for the, the scheme. But the thing I like about this photograph is all this here. This is the meter box or the little sort of meter box, and then you have the cable, the wires going in. The wires are just nailed to the, the ceiling here. But look at this. That, that's the smoke. That's the that's the, the, the lamp. The, 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 obviously, the tilly lamp or the, was probably hanging on a wall here or something, and, and it had smoke pattern in the, in the roof and ceiling. So um, that's the old and the new, the new world coming uh, in. And here we have this is an, actually a Tusk, a 1954 uh, celebration, the, the end of the lamp. And the feathers here are toasting the, the new light coming in. And more, more clergy uh, presiding over the switching on ceremony uh, and blessing the, some, the botany plant or something here. And more speech at the bay. It's the same thing. There's the guy, the reporter again, uh, busy taking notes. Um, okay, I'll just flash through these. these. Part of the, obviously, the, the demonstration or the selling emphasis was propaganda. So tremendous, there's a fantastic collection of uh, posters and stuff in the archive, um, trying to persuade people, you know, for the farm and all the things they can do. Uh, this is some kind of a food cooper. Yeah. The biggest, uh, in Monaghan, I know the biggest seller was a thing called a boiler. I don't know what it did. It just boiled potatoes, I suppose, for pigs and stuff. But the boiler was very popular. Uh, but, but in Monaghan, some of the parishes, like including my own, uh, they were very cagey about what they bought. And you see, when you look at some of those REO newsletter things, they talk about such a place was very hard going, you know, people didn't want to buy anything. So they would sell, list three irons, uh, three or four kettles, and nothing else, you know. And at the beginning, but of course, people copped on after about a year or so, they saw the value of the electricity and they started buying stuff. Uh, infrared, this is where chickens are thinking maybe hens and so on to keep the keep it laying eggs during the winter. The electric pump, very important. Uh, floor warming for animals. I don't know how many people went for many farmers went for that. <coughs> uh, home grinding, whatever that is. The taps of course were kind of water, big thing. Um, okay, big improvement. Okay. Switch on. Uh, in, in, in September nineteen fifty the book, one of the references is to uh, so, uh, Parish down in Tipperary, 1950 September, it was switched on, and an hour after it was switched on, uh, the first uh, ice cream was on sale in the sh local shop. <laughs> so we were getting ready to, to go. So I don't know how they did in an hour, but pretty good going. Uh, the, the, the people then were given, you know, they were given 100 watt bulbs initially, as a kind of free 100 watt bulb. But people didn't like them. And in many places, people didn't like them. The 100 watt was too bright, and some people said it put the fire out. <laughs> some people said, it, and then a lot of people said it was too expensive, the 100 watt bulb. So, um, so then the the, the electric electricity people gave them 20 watt bulbs. Said, okay, you don't like the 100 watt, here's the 20 watt. And after about a week of 20 watt, they said, give us back the 100 watt. Very good psychological approach. <laughs> okay. uh, the consequences, just, I just want to finish off looking at the consequences of all this. Yeah, these are just examples of, uh, in fact, I think this, this is from Thurla. Uh, the only place you'd see, I said earlier on that young people, you know, people under 50 have no memory of pre electric Ireland. Uh, and the only place you'd see examples of pre electric, pre -electric Ireland now is in museums. Like Turlock, uh, country, uh, was it the Museum of Country Life, uh, Muckross in, 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 uh, Museum, Folk Museum, and so on. They all, always have a little section about showing what, what life was like in a typical uh, household uh, before electricity, with lamps and so on and so forth. But here we have all the new stuff appearing, and these are from museums, these examples here that are taken in the photographs. Uh, I mean, I'm sure you can see things like, I think that's a washing machine, a small washing machine, 
this is a between the clubs at Washington Judaism uh, and so on. <laughs> Uh, REO News, the REO News, the Rural Electrification Office News, just the thing I mentioned. And every December, of course, before Christmas, they have a special edition. And they're always very, they were very interesting for the first 10 years. They were really pushing, so here's Santa Claus heading off, and he's full of electricity. <laughs> <laughs> Fridges and washing machines and all sorts of stuff there. And he looks pretty, he looks pretty unhappy too from the <laughs> uh, And this is, you know what this is here, 1957? Sputnik, yeah. Sputnik is here, dropping down all these parachutes. That came from them, you know? so somebody had a bit of imagination. This picture is, is I don't, this, this is one of the recurring pictures because you have the Sacred Heart picture appearing on the other, and then the old, a little, little red lamp appears with, with, the, with the electrical connections. So that was quite important. Uh, and then uh, I thought some of these, this, this is a bit blurry, you can see the, the message here, that electricity, clean kitchen, the man of the house sitting here, and say, nothing has changed. Glen Island. Glen Island is mentioned here. Actually, uh, no, it's just the time about Glen Island. Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, the weather. Uh, it was also an area of very considerable construction difficulties and might have been picturesque and fine weather, but as it was a purely a nightmare for Mr. Gallagher and his crew in the prevailing conditions. And so on. Uh, it was a bit of a nightmare, yeah, obviously. Uh, and, okay. And Fall Moor, this is up in. That's Ben Mullins, is it? Yeah, yeah. 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 it? To just mention it in the report, which is on the interview, they say, uh, summer migration to England for work is the usual uh, course for many in this area. Irish is the spoken language in some parts. Sales reflect the trend of income. Uh, local turf is cheap, so cookers don't sell very well. So, you know, electric cookers were having a chance here. But the fact is that people are going to England, and I can was the same. People have quite a lot of money, so Ackle had, had a good, you know, the people bought a lot of stuff compared with more areas where there wasn't migration uh, to Scotland or England. So that was interesting. In, in Monaghan, 1953-54, uh, 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 flax was, it was a big farming kind of cash crop in, in Monaghan. And 1953-54, the, the, the flax, price of flax, went through the floor, collapsed completely, and it was a complete disaster. And the ESB guys were there moaning that none of the, for, none of the people had any money for any fancy stuff, you know, because the flax thing had crashed, and, uh, and it stayed, never came back. Flax never, I just have a vague memory of seeing flax flower, you know, the blue flowers in the fields, but never saw it again after I was, whatever, six or seven. Uh, but, uh, so that was, the local local conditions were often important. Local conditions in Kildare and Leith, uh, no problem. Farmers up there were big farms, three, four, five, six hundred acres, and they were getting sweeps of lights in and getting machines and milking, milking machines and everything in, in the 1950s. Uh, this is, yeah, that's one of them, so I won't bother if I just mention that. So that's basically all I want to say, except uh, consequences. I just find a few, few little, uh, a few little memories are things that have my neighbor Stephen we, I had a neighbor we had a neighbor called Stephen uh, who was a bachelor probably in his I'd say the late 60s when the electricity connected so he, he was living in a thatched house and the thatch was actually rotten it was falling in and it was covered in tarpaulin and stuff and I remember in 61 61 census he came down to me because I was a scholar and I could fill in the form for him and I was filling in the form and I said to him, have you got the water in? One of the, the 1961 census was trying to measure the change that electricity or recording the changes that had come with electricity. And for example, they were measuring the number of houses with pipe water supplies. And I said to Stephen, have you got the water in, Stephen? And he looked at me and he said, I can't keep it out. Which is very <laughs> 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 but, but, but the other the main thing about Stephen was that after 
he got connect he got connected up, he signed up probably reluctantly, and he signed up for the electricity and the, the guy who was reading the meter, another neighbour, would come around every quarter to read the meter and it was going up, you know, two more units, two units, three units, four units, and he said to him, Stephen, how do you find the electricity? And he said it was great for lighting the lamp. <laughs> That's all he did. He switched it off, lit the lamp and switched it off. You know, it was, um, so, uh, and other, other things, I mean, just to finish off with, and then when we get to the 1960s, into the 1960s, you start Petrosan, lots of new houses started being built, and I think it was all connect, a direct uh, offshoot of the rural electrification, that, that you had extensions to houses, to older houses, and you had new houses, or bungalows, you had the bungalization of rural Ireland starting in, 19, in the 1960s. And there's a great quote from, the, the, the father of the bungalow, uh, Bungalow Bliss, Jack Simons, who wrote a book called Bungalow Bliss in 1971, I think it was. And one of the quotes he had in it that I think is, is, is amazing, it's interesting really, he says, lyrical as well, he says, uh, My heart leaps up when I behold, behold a cluster of bright modern bungalows near a modern school served by a tarred road with the majestic curve of pylon worn power lines sweeping along the mountain and through the brown bogs, and the glitter of the television areas in the evening light, and the poetry of the flushing of a WC, and the music of a hot bath film. That was a, that was a legacy of rural electrification. A friend of mine, a colleague of mine in Maloof, his brother, he remembers when, it, when the electricity came to outside Dilgarvan, and he remembers his brother, uh, for the two weeks after they were connected, his brother uh, sat in the bath, turning the tap on and off, on and off, and, and flushing the toilet, kept flushing the toilet, because his job before electrification was carrying water from the well. And this was his, he was just amazed at the, the change in his life. My mother said, uh, when, when we were connected up in 1954, <coughs> My mother uh, said that her life changed more in a week than the previous 20 or 30 years, you know. And it's true that, that really 1954, in the countryside, uh, and especially in the poorer parts of the countryside, life hadn't changed much in 100 years, you know. It nearly, I mean, a lot of the farms, a lot of the old buildings and so on, were still the same as they had been in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, you know. And uh, so the uh, electricity certainly uh, revolutionized it. So it was called, a book, it was a book published about uh, 30, uh, 1980s uh, called The Quiet Revolution by, uh, by a guy who was worked with the ESP and it was a record of, of his story really with the ESP and what they did. Michael Shields was his name, The Quiet Revolution. And that's what it was, it was a revolution in, in many ways. Okay.